Yeah. Rav Moshe Gersh really doesn't need an introduction. You guys are here because you probably have either read his book or have you heard his TED talk or whatever. Oh, I didn't even know you were here. But, uh, but in any event, I had the great privilege of uh, meeting him and becoming uh, friends. Uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, he continues to inspire me with his writings, uh, with his talks, with his personality. And I'm not going to continue because I could I could use the whole hour, but we obviously came here to uh, to hear of Moshe. So, Rav Moshe, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And um, I'll just say that a lot of the people here have read both books. Some of them have read one, um, but it's a tremendous privilege, and we're so grateful that you came to speak. So, thank you. <clears throat> so here we are. Thank you, Rabila. It almost feels small to say that we're just friends, I feel like at least good friends, great friends, <laughs> partners in crime. So, thank you. And now to be in Lev HaTorah. And it's nice, because I always think about the Torah, and then you come here, and then you get to remember, there's a Lev HaTorah, right? There's a, there's a depth, there's something that we're trying to connect with that goes beyond the words, that goes beyond the surface. I'm, my strong point is not projecting, so you tell me if you can't hear me. And yeah, you get back there. Okay, great. You would think that after seven years in a rock band, by now my strong point would be projecting, but the truth is we rely on the crutches that we have in our life. So I had a microphone in my hand from the age of 13, so I didn't have to work on getting too far. Maybe that's a good place to start, the crutches that we have in our life. I was in Los Angeles a few months ago, and I, uh, anybody here from LA, West Coast? Nice, okay, so if you know LAX, that doesn't happen so often, by the way. Like, I go all over Israel, so I feel like everyone's from New York, so it's nice to see just a few places from LA. Uh, anyway, I landed in LAX, my brother came to pick me up, and we got to his car, and we took my luggage, I had a couple pieces with me, we put it in the back, and <coughs> It was having a hard time close, like to close the back of the trunk, and we we're pushing it until finally, like we heard the click, the click, and it was kind of like a half click. And he looked at me and he said, "What do you think? Good enough?" And I was like, "Good enough." Like I heard the click, you heard the click. We get in the car, we're driving, and then at some point we just hear bang, <laughs> and like. Uh, we look in the rearview mirror and the trunk is up and my stuff's all over the floor and cars are swerving out of the way. Good enough. So sometimes we go through life and we think, oh, this is going to be good enough, right? <coughs> sometimes good enough is good enough and sometimes good enough gets your stuff all over the, the road. And it's important to figure out, well, what are the things that require just a little bit more than good enough, right? We're not just looking to pass the class. We're looking to do well at that area of life. So there's a quote that I think about quite often. Uh, it's in, in a book called A Course in Miracles, and it goes like this. That which is real can never be threatened. That which is unreal doesn't exist. And herein lies the peace of God. So... I'll say it again, because it's actually, if that's all we said tonight, is this one idea, you could sit and chew on that for the rest of your life. Right? That which is real can never be threatened. What, what does that mean? That means there's something in this world and there's something in our life that is so real that nothing can happen to it. That it's, it's always gonna be there, it's always gonna be okay. Nothing can threaten it. Its existence will continue on. And then there's something else in our life, in our experience of what it means to go through this world and what it means to be a human, that might look real and feel real, but is unreal. And in that, it doesn't really exist all that much. It's kind of here today, gone tomorrow. And if you can identify those two areas in your life, in your experience, so 
So you will be the one to walk away with the, the greatest gift in this world, which is inner peace, love, joy, the peace of being connected to God, whatever that is. So the question becomes, what's real? And increasingly in our generation, that question becomes more and more relevant. What is real, right? With AI and deep fakes and all the stuff that's going on everywhere, I don't even know what money is anymore. You've got Bitcoin, you've got cash, you've got credit. I don't know what's what. Well, then you've got in your own reality, there's your actual social life, then there's your social media life. Are they the same? Are they different? Is one real? Is one fake? Are they both real? They're just different levels of real? Like life has increasingly gotten interesting, challenging to try to figure out where, where are we? What, what is really happening in this world? But if you can find it and you can lean into it, you get to live with really what we're all looking for. So maybe if you guys will indulge me just for a moment, um, is it all right if we do like a short exercise? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you won't need much, but you will need to put um, like phones or pens down just for a moment. You'll just need your hands. Okay. Uh, and so whenever you can, just put them up like this. Okay. Okay. Now give me all your money. Okay. Haha. <laughs> uh, okay. No, not a hard <clears throat> exercise, uh, and it won't hurt much. Just repeat after me. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the secret to life: you make sure you get the round of applause in the beginning instead of at the end, so there's no pressure, you're already good. What do your hands feel like? Tingly. Tingly. Amazing. You ever heard this before? Who ever done this before? Tingly. That's the word. No matter where you are. I've spoken in lots of different countries. Tens of cities. Universally. In every language. That's the word for how your hands feel when you clap your hands together. Tingly. Okay, great. Um, how do your feet feel? What do your feet feel like? Like they're in my shoes. Nothing normal, like they're in my shoes. Okay, great. What did they feel like while you were clapping? Not there. I don't know. I don't know. Good. Not there. Truth. Leave the Torah. Right? I don't know. Why don't you know? Focus we're focusing on it. So now, I want to do it again, but before we clap again, if we can just take a moment or two and put all of your focus and attention into your feet right now, okay? Just everything into your feet, yeah? If it helps you to close your eyes, you can close your eyes, you don't have to, but really feel your feet. The warmth, you can feel the socks, you can feel the shoes around your feet. If your feet are on the floor, you can feel the pressure of your foot on the floor. And maybe just by a show of hands, if you can let me know when you could really feel your feet right now. Okay, we're almost there. Yeah, can you feel the feet in your shoes? Okay, I think more or less we're there. Okay, what I want you to do is don't leave. Stay in your feet. We're gonna clap again, and the exercise and the question is this, can you still feel your feet while you're clapping if you keep your attention there? Okay, not too difficult. Let's see what happens. Show of hands if you could feel your feet while you were clapping. Psh, amazing, right? Just about the entire room. What <coughs> changed? Focus. Focus. This really is one of the secrets to life. What you focus on, you feel. Okay? That's just simple realities. What you focus on, you experience. What you focus on becomes real to you. And what's amazing is that your feet were there before. The ground was there before. It was all there before, just one thing was missing. You. Your presence, your conscious awareness of your feet. That's the only thing that was missing, but it was there. It was happening, 
It was in this world, it was in this experience, but we were missing from that experience. And the question we then have to ask ourselves is what else already exists in our life that we're not feeling or experiencing, not because it's not there, but because we're not there. What else is already true in this experience that we're all having in this life? And we think, we say, oh, well, I don't have this, or I don't have that, or I don't feel this, or I don't feel that. And maybe it's not because it's not happening, or it's not there, but it's because we haven't found a way to tune into it. And when we find a way to tune into those things, so all of a sudden, life takes on new meaning. Life takes on a whole new experience. We're now in Adar Aleph, right? So you guys have been here for a minute. I, I probably put a good wager down that you experience and see and think a little differently than you did when you got here, right? You know, in the beginning of the year. You learn a little bit, you spend some time with other people from different places, you meet incredible mentors, Rebaim, you go around the country, you've been here during a trauma for the Jewish people, right? I mean, you've, so much has happened this year. There's no way you're the same person that you were when you got here. But not all that much changed other than what goes on here, right? So what's behind your eyes is more important than what's happening in front of your eyes, right? Your processing, that's what makes life life. So how do we tune into the things that we're really looking for? How do we get more of the goodness that's really there? More of what's really real in our life experience. So uh, I'll share with you a great story. We just moved to Ramat Beit Shemesh, by the way. So we're now neighbors. So this was actually a much easier trip than the last time we did this. Okay, look, if you want to make the walk. <laughs> so, my son, who is, he's about five years old, and he was sitting on the couch one day, and he was, it was like, I think it was right air of Shabbos, or right in the beginning of Shabbos. He was sitting on the couch. Uh, my newest book had just come out, so it was sitting on the couch next to him, The Three Conditions, and my brother-in-law, uh, walked in, he was, they were coming over for Shabbos, and he saw my son, he said, Akiva, good Shabbos. He said, good Shabbos. He said, I see this book over there. Is it any good? Remember, my son's five, and he looks at him and he goes, yeah, it's good. So he says, what does it say? He said, I don't know. So he said, how do you know it's good? And he said, because my Abba showed me inside where it says he loves Akiva. <laughs> and I was like, that's like one of the most profound things I've ever heard, right? We think we have to understand the story to judge whether or not it's good or not. But there might, only ha there might have to be just one line, which is the author says he loves you, and the story is a good story. You might not understand the whole book. But if you focus in on and tune in on the one sentence, the one moment, the one element of the life that matters. So all of a sudden, is it a good book? Of course it's a good book. Is it a good story? Of course it's a good story. I like to think about, you know, at the end of the day, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who suffer. We live in a world where there's a lot of suffering and there's a lot of pain. And some of it's physical, but for most people that I speak to, it's not just the physical that's a challenge. It's not just the surface. It's the mental element that turns pain into suffering. Pain is inevitable. We go through this life, we're gonna have pain. But suffering is a choice. Suffering is what we do with our mind once there is pain. And we perpetuate it, so it's the anxiety around it, it's the depression around it, it's the loneliness, it's the fear, it's the um, frustration and the irritation and all the pieces that we carry around the, the, the space that we're in. And so we try to figure out, well, how do we, how do we unplug from that and tune into the piece that's going well? But there's so much noise. There's like a lot of noise going on in our mind around the life that we're in. So turning down the noise and tuning in becomes one of the main things in our entire life when we can tune into what's real, tune into what's good, tune into the love of ourselves, the love of our life. That actually changes the entire experience as we're going through it. I like to think about it like this. We're born at some point that you didn't choose, not 
consciously. I mean, spiritually you did, but down here you didn't. And then at some point we check out and we say goodbye. And then there's all the time in between, right? So at some point, our life is a dash between two dates. Our life's the dash though. That's the whole thing is the meantime. It's what happened in between. So we can go through life like this, or we can go through life like this, it just or, or, or higher. How high do we want to go as we're going through it? But we have going through it isn't the choice. We're going to go through it. We're born and we're going to be here for some time. And things are going to happen while we're here. And we're going to do good and we're going to probably make some mistakes along the way. But how we experience the life that we're going through while it's happening, that's really where our choice is. I was once sitting on that same couch and I was, it was a Shabbos afternoon, I was meditating. For those of you who don't have children in this room, finding quiet on Shabbos is more challenging than it was when you're a bachar. And when you've got lots of little kids running around, it can be loud. But there was one auspicious afternoon, all my kids went out to play, my wife had gone to a neighbor, and there was like pin drop silence in the home. I sit, I'm gonna go sit, meditate, I, I sit down, and I close my eyes, and about 15 seconds later, I just hear the door bash open, and kids are excited, and my seven-year-old daughter comes into the room with her seven-year-old cousin, Ahava and Mayan, and she, I hear one say to the other, let's go ask Abba for popcorn. And they're like, yeah, popcorn. And so they come in the room, and she goes, Abba, can we have, oh, we can't ask him. And my aunt says, why not? And she says, oh, because he's meditating. She goes, oh. And Ahava says, I think he'll let us have it anyway. <laughs> let's, let's just go to the kitchen. So she turns around, she starts watching, walking to the kitchen, and my aunt says, what'd you say? And she said, oh, I think he'll let us have it anyway. And she said, no, that other thing, metamating? And she was like, no, no, he's meditating. She's like, yeah, yeah, what's that? So my daughter looks at her and says, oh, he's talking to Hashem. And my aunt says, oh. And my daughter says, yeah, you should try it sometime. You'll love it, right? When you hear these seven-year-olds speaking, it's so cute, it's so innocent, it's so beautiful. And my aunt looks at her and says, ah, I do talk to Hashem, but he never talks back. So Ahava looks at her and says, that's why you should meditate. <laughs> and then I started laughing and my meditation was over at that point. But uh, what was true was she said something very beautiful, which was there's a difference between speaking to Hashem, talking to God, prayer, and there's something else, which is getting quiet, which is learning how to listen, learning how to focus, learning how to go in. And that's how we tune into what's coming at us as opposed to just all the projections that we have in our mind. So what I'd like to do, if you'll give me just a few more minutes of your time, you guys all know each other here so. by this point, a little bit. Okay, just wanna do a short exercise. You'll need someone next to you. And I just want you to introduce yourself Hi, my name is this, I do this and that. Like your general introduction to who you are as a human being, where you're from, what your hobbies are, what you like to do, how you spend your time, all the good stuff in an introduction. Um, but it's 10 years from now, okay? So now it's 20, 34, Tufshin, Tzadik, Dalit. And a minute apiece, and then we'll come back, yeah?
president's going to be, but it's okay. I don't know what's going to happen later this month. Uh, I'd like to hear from you. What were your thoughts about that experience? Well, I can tell you right now for me specifically, I'm drafting to the army in less than two months, so while I do think about those things, of course, about what my life's going to look like in 10 years from now, I have more concerned about what my life's going to look like two months from now. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of gets to me. 90% of a brain waves right now. Yeah. Um, so this was really put that into in perspective for me. How, you know, if you ask me a question a year ago, I could give you a whole spiel about what I'm going to do 10 years from now. But then I got a rest of my life and dropped out of college to join the Army. Um, so I can't even think of the 10 months from now. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, no, that makes sense. By the way, I don't think most people sit walking around all day thinking about 10 years from now. So it, it, it is a broad perspective shift. Yeah. I think you really put things in perspective in terms of what, what I want to focus on now, what I want to pursue. In terms of like now, try, as, yeah, as in get to now I have a trajectory. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Oh, look at these meetups. Amazing meetups. Oh, it it kind of gave me a mini panic because I feel like I have like a, like a really large fork, many different ways to go, and I, don't, I haven't really decided what I want to do yet. And I, you know, and then I'm 10 years from now, which fork would I pick? <laughs> <laughs> How many other people here felt some anxiety or panic around that? Yeah? It's amazing, eh? It's, it's usually about 50% of the room. It's like, 50% of the room was like, wow, that was awesome, that was so cool. I got to think about my future, I got to have this whole fun ex experience and exercise, and the other half were like, why did you do that to me? <laughs> 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 we thought you were nice, <laughs> right? Amazing, yeah. Um, what I found is that when I was looking into the future, I wasn't looking into sort of material things or job I'd be in. I just looked in what goals have I set personally for myself and my characteristics and things that I wanted and if I'd reach them or not. That's that's what I was focusing on. That's awesome. It speaks volume, volumes about your nature. Yeah. So I kind of felt that like, oh, that was really cool. I'm going to do all this stuff, but like, I should probably get started now. <laughs> right. It sounds like this like a trajectory. Right? Yeah. I kind of felt like the hard part was over and I was already like living in in like nice and settled and routine. So, Feels good. Um, and that, yeah, and then like starting to think of like, okay, what are my aspirations in the next 10 years? So 
Fascinating. Amazing. Yeah. So um, I think I might have done a similar exercise last year. It's very interesting to see what has changed. Yeah. You know, I don't remember exactly what my answer was last year. To see what I'm focusing on now and what that's going to look like is it's really interesting. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, we'll do one more. Um, I think I just smiled. There's a lot of possibility. It was really cool. That's awesome. Uh, I'm curious to know some of the, you don't have to go through all of them, but what did it look like? What were some of the things where you, I heard people saying that there were like accomplishments and your life looked a certain way. What were the, the pieces in your life that were there? Yeah. Uh, wife and kids. Wife and kids. Finished college. Finished college. I hope 10 years, long time. You can become a doctor. <laughs> Spirituality. Spirituality. Sorry? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Like overall happiness. Overall happiness. Cured cancer. Okay. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. I gotta come back to this place more often. Yeah. After two shots. I'm in. Okay, and you should have the bracha then. If it's going really well, you should even be finished by then. Right? If, if you want it. And if you want it, that's going to be going slower than exactly half. Fulfilling career? Uh, for, I'm in. Fulfilling career. Right? What else? Amazing. Um, did anybody paint a bad picture? Amazing, eh? We're pretty good. Yeah, one? Huh? You went bald. Okay. That, 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 is, that is subjectively bad. But, you know, the, the, there could be good in there also. But we can talk later. We'll talk. Right? We, we, generally speaking, we paint good pictures of our future. Right? In, in an exercise like that. It might be anxiety provoking. You might be like, I don't know. There's, it could be like this. It could be like that. But whatever you chose, right? You chose things that you, on some level, were happy about, were excited about. Usually you hear family, career, maybe some hobbies, uh, huge accomplishments, right? Like that's, that's what we're looking to do. Human beings are kind of built pretty similarly, right? There's a reason why we choose what we choose. But if we, if we go into that and we ask, well, what's behind that? Why did you choose the life that you just chose, right? We all just fabricated a future reality for ourselves. Why was that the reality we chose? That we're believing that we will end up the most happy. Right? What's your name? Ezra. Ezra, thank you for being a help. We choose the vision of the life that we choose because we believe that that's going to make us feel happy. It's a pretty simple. This is one of the rules of human experience. We want the things we want because we believe that in achieving those desires, we will feel good. We want what we want because we believe that if we get that, we're going to feel better than we were without that. So we create a picture of the future. Uh, and that future could be 10 years from now, or if you're being drafted and you're thinking six months from now, so you're thinking six months from now, but whatever that is, right, wherever you're going, we're thinking about the things we want and what we want, it's because we believe that there's happiness on the other side of that, right? My, the, by the way, the word happiness is, is exchangeable. Some people have a negative connotation around happiness, not sure how that happened, but it has happened along the way. Uh, but it's not just happiness, it's fulfillment, it's feeling good, it's the word successful, we all want to feel successful, we want to feel joyful, we want to feel at peace, we want to feel spiritual, we want to feel connected. There, are, All of those things mean the same thing. There is a good feeling that we want to feel in that wholeness, right? In Torah we call this shlemus. There's a natural desire to feel shalem, and we are moved by that, and we get different pictures of what we think will give us that shlemus. That's what life is. Life is basically a game of pictures, where, of objects in our consciousness that we say, okay, when I get to this, when I get there, when I get this, then I'll be happy, then I'll be enough, then I'll be successful, then things will be okay. That's what we do with everything in our life. But the thing is, very often, that creates uh, what, in it's all the same to me, I've called the if-there-then distortion, right? Which is a distortion of thinking. 
which is we put our joy and our happiness and our success at some future point or at the end of some achievement if my conditions change when I get there in space or then in time then I'll be happy then I'll be okay then I'll be enough when I'm finally married then I'll be happy when I'm finally wealthy then I'll be okay when I'm finally successful then my life will make sense that's what we do in our minds and so we go and we chase and achieve and we chase and achieve and we are in this state of perpetual striving because what happens even in even in a uh, the dream scenario where you're already 10 years later you tell me that you're thinking about your next aspirations for the next 10 years right like we we, we go we achieve and then we think about well what's next because what ends up happening is the more we believe that our feeling of joy, that feeling of connection that we're really looking for, the more that we believe it's contingent on something outside of us, the more we're essentially destined or doomed to stay in a cycle of constant chasing. Our life becomes chasing. It's, it's about something else. People often think that the follow through on this statement is, oh, so what, I shouldn't have goals, I shouldn't have dreams, I shouldn't have priorities. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, wouldn't it be nice if instead of acting for joy, you acted from joy? What if we could flip it? What if there was a way to come from your wellspring of natural felt sense of connection and joy and happiness and knowing the goodness of who you are and the potential and power of who you are and therefore you can be inspired by instead of needing the thing to actually feel like you've made it. What kind of a life do you think you could live if you were starting from there? It's a completely different experience. If you come from love and you come from that inspiration and that enthusiasm, it's a different life as you're going through. I think in sports, it's probably a good place, a good analogy for where we can draw a lot of wisdom. And there's, there's kind of like two types of athletes, two types of sports players. Some play with like a chip on their shoulder and they're motivated by things that went wrong along the way, things that were said to them, things that they feel like they needed. And that does, you, you can be motivated to get things done. But if you look at the people, anybody here into sports at all? Is there like a small contingency of people here, right? So like if, you, if you're into that, so you'll probably notice that the people who play with a chip on their shoulder, they're, they're, they look like they're playing with a chip on their shoulder. I mean, they, that, that's their experience. Their experience is one of, I'm fighting against, I'm in, a, I'm in battle with this life. I'm in war. There are other people who, they just love what they're doing. It doesn't mean they don't find motivation, but they're just, they love it. They love the sport, or they love the thing they're doing. And they believe in themselves, or they believe in their team. There's a high level of, we're there, and now I just want to see that in reality. I want to go out there and I want to make it happen. Those people, their careers, they're, long, they're, they're longer. There's a certain level of longevity that comes with that when you love what you do, when you're not doing it just because there's a chip on your shoulder. Because for a lot of people, by the way, once you get there, then what? Do you know how many I speak to, not millionaires, but multimillionaires and billionaires that I speak to every single week that come to speak to me about what do I do now? I am completely depressed. I have all the money, so I'm finished. <laughs> I have nothing left to do here. <laughs> there, there is a mindset that thinks, well, if I just get there, then I'll be enough. But guess what? Even when you get there, that's not enough because the joy, the real success, that's an ashama thing. That happens on the inside. So what we're really looking for is the keys to the real car, is to getting back into that space. So how do we get there? What's the, the way in? So I, I like the words, feel good now. I use that as the name of 
the talk that I give, feel good now, and I like the anchors, feel good and now, right? If you just, it's easy to remember, right? Feel good now. You, if, if you walk away from this and you didn't take any notes, you could at some point be like, I think he spoke about feeling good now. That's pretty easy. If you really think about it and ask you, what do you want? That's what we want. We want to feel good now. So let's open those up, double click on each of those words. What does it mean to feel? Okay. You tell me, what, is, what does it mean to feel? When your body's feeling yourself. Okay. Physical, sensory experience is being told. Great. Dopamine is releasing your body. Uh, text, I mean, that's one feeling would be dopamine, right? But it could be another chemical, I guess, also, right? Sure. Being more aware. Aware of? <coughs> oh, yeah, I guess. Of uh, what's around you and what's going on, the, what, what you're seeing and what you're hearing. And right, exactly. It's like some interpretation or some awareness of what's taking place. Good. I like that. That's a good definition. Just, just don't want to be happy. Just huh? be content. Yeah, no worries. but the, the, the word feel, not feel good. Just the word feel, what, is, what does it mean to feel something? Um, the emotion onto, uh, um, onto a pre-existing state. It's an emotion of a pre-existing state? Yeah, I mean, like I'm thinking of it as like, an emotional feeling, like an emotion onto a pre-existing state of feeling. Okay, it sounds very psychological to me. <laughs> Uh, no, it's good. We're, we're, right now, we're just having fun. Yeah. Have some sort of connection with something else? Yeah, it's a connection to something. I'm connecting to something. Right? Yeah? Yeah? Uh, yeah, I think the key word there is experience. Like, there's some experience that's happening. Yeah? Your brain is your whole body. Your brain is telling your body, feel something. But what's the, the feeling? So I think what we're, we're all kind of dancing around over here is to feel something is to experience something, is to know something. Right? That's, what, well, that's what it means when you say, I'm feeling this way. If, if I said you can't use the word feel, what would you say instead? I'm experiencing this thing. I'm aware of this thing happening in my body. So there's an awareness, a knowing, it's a feeling. Okay, so here's what it is. What you feel is that which is real to you, right? What you feel is real to you. That's what a feeling is. It doesn't make it reality, right? It can be real to you even if it's not reality. Trust me, turn on the news or turn on any social media app and you'll see a lot of people walking around who feel one way even if it's not reality. We live in a very, very interesting world. But it's real to the person experiencing it, right? That's like you're saying, what do you mean it's real? Um, a person who has uh, anxiety, right? Even if it's like, there are people who have, uh, what are they called when you have an irrational anxiety? Phobia. phobia. People have phobias, right? They, they see a spider on the wall. A person who has true arachnophobia will run out the other side. They will not be found in this room. Now, is that real? Is it, I mean, is it it's real to be so afraid of spiders? Not, not really. But they're probably fine, right? A spider crawling on the, I mean, I guess it depends what kind of spider, but the one crawling here, it's like, it's probably gonna, you're probably gonna be okay. But it's so real to that person. You wanna know how I know it's real? They, if you check their blood pressure afterwards, it's real, it's having a physiological response. What you feel is real to you, even if it's not reality, okay? We live in a time that's like really big on like validating all emotions and all experiences, and it's like, you validate the fact that the person is feeling it, even if it's not reality, but the person is still experiencing something. It is real to them. I'll tell you a great story. You guys um, know this, the scratch lotto things? Yeah. 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 This one guy looks at me like, yeah, I know what those are. <laughs> not saying who. Yeah. So there was a time when we really, you know, we could have used the extra money. And I think I was somewhere and I was feeling lucky and I went and I bought one of these scratch lottos. It was like a blackjack scratch lotto thing. And I sit down and I'm in the McCollette and sitting there and like, yeah, I'm not thinking of it. And I'm scratching and then I'm looking. 
and I saw that I won, so I went to go like scratch off the prize. And it was 250,000 shekels. The biggest, like the biggest prize, like that you could get. So I'm like doing double take and I'm looking at it and you check this thing like 10 times. So like, I'm not crazy, right? Once I was sure that I won, the, the very first thing I noticed, I didn't jump on the table I was at. And I always imagined myself jumping on a table if I won the lottery. It didn't happen. <laughs> but the second thing I did was I looked around the room to make sure that I wasn't being followed as I slowly put this thing in my pocket and I'm walking out. And on the way to the car, I'm like, okay, Meister's going here. Like, I start walking a little bit faster. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna buy this present for my wife. I'm paying these bills. And like, by the time I get to the car, like I've spent all the money, but it was, it was great. And I got to the car and I get in and I close the door and I lock the door and I lock the door and I lock the door. And uh, I, I took out the, my phone. I was like, who do I call first, my wife or my dad? Like, I was like, you know, it was one of those deep existential questions. Like, and I was like, okay, I, I got to tell my wife. So I went to, I took a picture of the ticket to send it to her just to, you know, get her excited. I took it out, I took the picture, and I was about to click send, and I realized I read the ticket wrong. And it was backwards, the house won. I didn't win 250,000 shekels. But I sure thought I did. <laughs> And I went through all the, I, I went through the experience of someone winning the jackpot. I didn't, I didn't walk away with the money, but I went through the whole thing. I was sweating, I was excited, the emotions, the this, that, the phone call, the spending, all of this, all the dreams, but I lost. It was great. I was laughing so hard afterwards. It was an amazing experience. Cause I knew that I could share it at a talk like this and you'd get it. I was like, ah, oh, thank you for that mushal Hashem. Like that, you don't get a better mushal than that. Like that's unbelievable. My wife didn't think it was as funny. Um, yeah. <laughs> Say that again. Oh yeah, no, then I looked at it like 20 more times to make sure that I really did lose. Um, by the way, the ticket wasn't a, a losing ticket. The ticket actually won 400 shekels. Yeah. So like, I didn't walk away with nothing, but it's amazing how 400 shekels feels like you lost when you think that you're getting 250,000, right? Again, it's all happening up here. So that's feel, okay? Feel is that which is real to you, okay? That's what, what in Torah, we say feeling, we call it a hergish, um, but in, in Kabbalah and Hasidus, we use the word das. It's your, your das is the part of you that experiences reality. It's your knowing. It's the part of you that knows what's happening. You have a certain connection and affinity with something that's taking place in your life. So the second, so that's feel. What, what is good? Okay, now the fact is it's quarter to nine on a Tuesday night. And if I ask what is good, and there's a lot of really deep thinkers here. We could be here for a long time. It's a very powerful philosophical question. What is good? So we won't go down that road right now, but maybe one day we can come back and have a long conversation about the definition of good, but more simple. Torah's understanding of good, tov, right? Because I'll associate it with, with the very first time it's mentioned in the Torah is by light. The first thing called good is light, or there's a certain fundamental idea in Torah that the very first time something shows up in the Torah, there's a reflection of that idea in the word itself. So goodness and light are linked. That which is good is that which reflects God in this world. There's a reason why God and good are related in the English language. There's a, they're, they're connected because we're trying to figure out how closely related they are. Goodness is the degree to which you can perceive God in anything. And to the degree that you can't, to the degree that it's broken off, from our ability to perceive the godliness of this thing, we call it bad. The word bad in Hebrew is ra, ra. We translate it as bad or evil, but it comes from the word ra'ua, which means unstable, or teruah, which means broken up sounds. It means broken off from, it means disjointed, disconnected. So when something is disjointed, it's disconnected from my ability to perceive God in it, so I call that bad. If I can see God in it, then it's good. So now let me ask you, where is God? Everywhere. So what is good? Everything. Everything. Right? So when we say Gamzula Tova, it's not like it's like a band-aid. <laughs> really, that's like the highest level is to be able to perceive the goodness in everything. We can't. Right? 
We actually can't perceive the goodness in everything, which is why there's a word for evil, because the human mind cannot comprehend the entire picture. So we actually do speak about this thing called negative or bad. But essentially, if you go all the way in, it's going outside. You know how most people think about good? Most people, whether they realize it or not, are walking around with a definition of goodness, which sounds like this. If I like it, it's good. If I don't like it, it's bad. That's a crazy world to live in. It is like comp the most unobjective reality. But that's how most people are walking around. The judgment of what I think about this, if I like it, it's good. If I don't like it, it's bad. If I believe in it, it's good. If I don't believe in it, it's bad. And then you have eight billion different versions of good and bad. Eight different, billion different versions. Well, guess what? That's not what's good and bad. That's what you feel. And what you feel is real to you. But what is good? Good is reality. Good is the degree that you can perceive God in reality. Good is truth, capital T, truth. And so really what we want to do is we want to feel good. We want to make reality what I feel. I want to sense truth. I want those two things to be in alignment. They don't always go that way, but that's the ideal. The capital F feel, that which is real to me, even if it's not reality, well, I want to actually feel, experience, know what's true, what's good, what's God. That would be the ideal way to go through this life, right? Just to bring us back to how, do we, how did we get here? Because again, we're talking about what is real and that which is real can never be threatened. And that which is unreal doesn't exist. And if you can find what's real, you're gonna live with peace. And then we did the exercise about clapping. And what you focus on, you're gonna feel. So therefore your focus and attention is gonna be extremely important. And then we did the exercise with 10 years and we figured out that everything we want in this world, we want because we wanna experience that goodness. But we also know that we have a certain way of going through life where we think if I like it, it's good. If I don't like it, it's bad. But that's just what you feel. But there is a goodness we can tap into. And that it's just a single question, which is, so how do I go from what I think is real to reality? That becomes the most important question of your life. Because if you can get that, you've won. You have what's real. That means you don't actually need the thing on the outside to already feel good about your entire existence. To feel good about this, this world that we live in. And guess what? Hashem wants us to feel that way. Right? The highest thing you can experience through the lens of Torah is this thing called dveikos to Hashem, a connection to Hashem. Do you know how dveikos feels? I'll give you one guess. Good. <laughs> feels good. When you're connected, it's associated with simcha, joy, shleimus, wholeness, right? Holiness, oneness, goodness, purity. It's essential. So all of that happens when you're plugging into this thing. But we have this idea of like, to make us to Hashem and the spiritual concepts and all these things and we put them so far up that it's like well can I actually get there can I experience it and maybe it's just something I get to experience sometimes I, I don't really get to live with that I'm more over here but that's happening up there but the truth is enlightenment this whole world idea that we're speaking about is not about something that's way out there it's happening in you it's, it's not something you have to change. It's a realization of something that's already there. The fact that you're even still with me at almost nine o'clock at night on a Tuesday already speaks to the nature of the greatness of this room. So I wanna give one of the keys in, maybe the most powerful key, and then share with you one thought and story before uh, we let some people go. When I said feel good, I didn't say, most of us think we want to feel good and then we push it off. We think we're going to feel good later. The reason why I like the phrase feel good now is because it's not just what we want, but it's actually the only way in. It's the only way in is now. It's so... interesting to me that the most powerful things are the most obvious things and they're the things that are staring at us in the face and I think in a kind of a cliche way you read a book or you watch a film or 
you think about a scenario where a person's going through something and then they lose their job or they lose their this or they get in a breakup or something like that happens in their life and then that's when they realize all the small things in their life, right? Like, oh, I should have spent more time with my kids or I can't believe I had this amazing spouse with me the whole time or I can't believe I was, you know, living this great life. It's like at, when we take things for granted, it's only at the end when something challenging happens that we wake up and it's like, but it was in front of you the whole time. So you know what's in front of us always? This is a crazy thought. Whatever's in front of you, always. There's always something in front of you. There's always something you're experiencing. And Chazal teach us that if you go to that place, if you go to now, here, and stop projecting, so your entire life shifts. There's a com completely different life you experience because most of our mind is caught up in the past and the future. As the vast majority of our time. Think about the conversations you have with your friends. What are you speaking about? Something that happened or something you're going to do. What are we speaking about? One of the one of the beauties, one of the milas of Torah. You sit and learn Torah, you know what you're speaking about? <coughs> you're just speaking about truth. You're speaking about reality. When you learn Torah, you're not talking about what was, you're not talking about what will be. Again, there's some midrashim about the future and there's stories about the past. I'm not saying there's none of that there. But you're trying to understand it on a fundamental level. You're going to a higher place. It's a different space to live at. Most of the time, our minds are wrapped up in something that doesn't exist. The past is an imagination. The future is an imagination. They're just ideas in the brain. But you know what does exist? Now. Your feet. <laughs> now. Your feet were there before. Your feet are still here. There's, all, there's so much happening, and all you have to do is come back to what exists here now. And we so readily take for granted the entirety of this life experience. Life is so good. And I don't mean to say it's good for everyone at every moment, because there are challenges for many people at many moments. But for everyone, at any given moment, guess what? You won the cosmic lottery. Right? The fact that you were born, just to begin with, is like one in four trillion. Yeah? So you're here. You made it. We're on a rock floating through space. <laughs> there is an atmosphere. <laughs> there is gravity. Like, that's enough. Like, we could say, Dayenu, there's gravity. Like, like, you're not flying away. Like, that's a miracle. That's a miracle that shouldn't exist. Guess what? It doesn't exist on all the other planets that surround us, at least on this part of the solar system, right? So it's like, that's pretty amazing. There's oxygen. You can breathe. You can all think every single person <clears throat> in this room, right? You can see, taste, smell, touch. All of that. It's like the entire th food didn't have to taste good. We, ha we would end up having to eat anyway. Right? An amazing thing. The in the c we have to remember context, like go broad. The context of every one of your problems is everything's a miracle, amazing and perfect, and yet I'm going to be frustrated about this one thing in front of me. That one thing we're getting frustrated about is actually leaving the present moment because look what else is here. Like, where are we focusing? Do we realize the bigness of this life? It's so big, it's so powerful, and it's so good. There's a there's a Leshem, the Leshem, who was one of the great Mekubalim of the 19th century, early 20th century, and who is uh, Rav Yashiv's grandfather, and he writes over there in the beginning of his Sefer that really that's the way back to God, is through this space. That the name Hashem, Yud Kei Vav Kei, the letter Yud, when you put a Yud in front of a word, what does it do? future tense, right? So there are some words that it can't mean future. Do you know what it does to those words? So Rashi and Chumash. But it says that when you put a Yud in front of a word grammatically, if it can't be future, it makes it tamid, makes it always, perpetual, right? Um, by Mordechai and Haman, right? We're in other. It says, Lo yichra velo yishtachave. It means he never bowed. He never prostrated himself to Hama. So there's a lo, so it turns it instead of always, it makes it never. But the yud doesn't mean he didn't will bow. It means he never bowed. 
right? So Yud makes it always. The next three letters of the Shem Hashem, Yud Ke Vav Ke, are He, Vav, and He. Hove, Hove means present. present. So God's name means always present, forever present, perpetually here, always now. And that the way into experiencing God in your life is to actually be so present, so in love with the moment, so appreciating everything that's happening, that you, you can dream about the future. You can have goals, but the love of your life happens when you're actually here now. This is not about not planning, but I like to say plan as if you'll live, live as if you'll die. You have to plan as if you live. You have to plan like there's a tomorrow, but you gotta live it like there's only today. Chazal say, Im lo achshav emasai, if not now, when? Most of it thinks that means carpe diem, seize the day. Rav Chaim Friedlander and others explain what it really means is, if it's not now, when is it? It's only ever now. Now is the only thing that exists. Everything else is an illusion. Everything else is unreal. Everything else is a thought in your mind. And that which is unreal doesn't really exist. But if you grab onto the thing that's real, and it can never be threatened, because there's always now, wherever you are, it's now. How do I know, by the way? 20 minutes ago, when was it? Now. It, it was now, 20 minutes ago, right? And that moment, it was now. And in 20 minutes from now, you'll say, well, it'll be then, <coughs> but it won't be, because when it's then, it will be now. Life is experienced only ever now. It's the only thing that's real. And if you make that, you don't have to say only, but at least the priority of your consciousness, of your attention, of your focus, you will live a completely different life. Because every time you complain, and all the blaming, and all the frustration, and all the irritation, and all the things that we carry in our life, they come from over-prioritizing the illusion of the past and future. It's not that they don't exist, but it's that there's, there's, you've made it too much in your mind, in your focus. So maybe just to end with a, a story, and then I'm happy to stick around afterwards if people want to schmooze a bit. Um, Rabbi Eli reminded me before, that I didn't have a chance to share my story here tonight. Some of you know, some of you don't. I did. I spent seven years as the lead singer of a rock band. We were signed to a record label. We toured the country uh, many times. Uh, you might have heard of some of the other bands we were playing with. It was like a really, really awesome thing that was going on. And at some point, I had a really powerful awakening experience <coughs> along the way where I realized I didn't want to stay playing music forever. And my drummer was going through a very challenging time. He got addicted to meth, which is a very heavy drug. And I didn't know what to do. I came to Israel to get some clarity and I came to visit a friend of mine. His name uh, is Isaiah Rothstein and he was uh, learning in this yeshiva in Ramah Chemish. It was called Leva Torah. And I came to visit him and I sat in on a class and there was a rabbi there named Rabbi Fawasser and he was saying some things and afterwards he sat with me and he really left this powerful impression in my experience of like maybe i should go to yeshiva maybe i should spend some time and learn torah and he planted a really powerful seed and he looked at me like with no qualms he was like why don't you just go to yeshiva <laughs> i don't know i'm in a rock band i'm going on tour in three weeks he was like so cancel it <laughs> I was like, no. And I went back, but the seed germinated, and six months later, I, I left the band and I came to Yeshiva. And we only realized it a couple years ago when I came back. I'm like, something something about this place. It wasn't in this building. I left it. It was in the, in, in the old building. Um, you never know what experience is going to show up for you in your life. But when you're open to it, when you're open for it, and you let those seeds go in, you don't know what 10 years is gonna look like. 10 years from now, you guys can call me, let me know if it all came true. But the process, I care much more about how you live the next 10 years than where you end up. The outcomes, they're not up to you. You never get to control every variable to control the outcomes. But who you are while it's happening, how you live the life as you go through, the experience you have as it's happening, that's actually the gift of life. At the end, it's a date. 
the process is everything. It's not just to say, oh, live for the journey, forget the, out forget the achievements you want. No, go for the big things, love it. Everyone here should be blessed to have the family they want to have and blessed to have the parnasa they want to have and to have the jobs and to have the hobbies and to steig in Torah and to uh, have a deep connection with the Kaddish Baruch Hu in all the areas. All of those things should be there. Most importantly, you should love yourself in the process. If you have that as you're going through it, it turns the entire experience from, yeah, eventually I made it to, I loved everything that happened regardless. You should be blessed to get there and get there together. Good way. Um, gentlemen, we're going to take a couple of questions. Uh, I also want to uh, thank and acknowledge Rav Paltiel, Rav Leo, and Rav Shimshon for joining us this evening. Um, Rav Moshe is going to take a couple of questions, and then he's going to be available to speak to. And we have three books uh, for sale that I will be handling. So, so in your book, also to me, great, and in your second book. You kind of talk about the idea of being happy in the moment, and like that's very beautiful. And tonight, when you were talking, you also talked about the idea of being happy in the moment, but also balancing the goals of the future, thinking about the future. But if you're so happy and content with the moment, why would you be worried about the future? Oh, I love that. You asked it in your book also. I just didn't really understand the answer. Yeah, yeah, no, I love that. I love that because I, I spent the day speaking to a close friend of mine about that. So I love the hashkacha. So thank you. So that's one, one of the most common questions I receive is that exact question, which is, wait a second, if I get so much joy from the present moment, how will I, why would I ever think about or plan for the future, right? So part of it is, you're, there's a part of your awareness that knows that there is a future for all intents and purposes. That's why it's not only, it's prioritizing the now in terms of your focus and your consciousness and not letting it, you, you know what it would be like? I'll give you a, a metaphor. You're using your phone and you're using a particular app on your phone, but there's 37 other apps that are open while you're using your app. Is your app gonna run as smoothly? Probably not, depending on how good your phone is. But even if it does, it's gonna drain the energy from the phone. So ideally, you close all the other apps and then just use whatever you're gonna use on the phone. If you want the energy to last longer. So it's, you want to be right there, but how many other things are going on in the periphery of your mind while you're going through life? So when we talk about being present, it's to say there's a time to plan, there's a time to think about the future, and guess what? While you're doing that, that's also what you're doing in the moment. There's like a time for planning. Right? There's a time to make a chesh bon nefesh. There's a time to sit there and make a vision for the future. When you're doing that, you're fully in the planning. But then when you put it away, and now you go to do the next thing, you're fully in the next thing. Right? You don't, you're not also planning while you're doing that. So the issue becomes, you make a plan, and then the anxiety around the plan sits with you for the rest of the day, because you never closed the app when you went into the next thing. That's really the issue, right? Or the, the concern that we'd have in terms of like balancing the two. So yeah, I'm fully in the moment. At some point, my wife is gonna wonder where I am if I don't make it home, right? Meaning at some point there, there will come a time for me to say bye and I, I will go home. But if I'm thinking about her concern of what time I get home while I'm sitting here trying to speak to you, I wouldn't be present with you. Meaning you would have lost my full experience because I'm somewhere else. And I wouldn't even be giving over the best version of whatever I could say because I'm thinking about some other concept while it's happening. So it's not that you don't eventually have to get up and do the next thing or plan you know, a five-year goal or a three-year goal. But if, if the whole time, if your goal is to, somebody here said, to finish college, right? So if the goal is to finish college, if the entire time you're in university, you're just thinking, I gotta finish college. I gotta finish college. So you, you might or might not finish, right? You might or might not, like any four years, but what's for sure is you had anxiety for four years about finishing. That would be the problem, right? Is that you make the goal and then you just go do it. Go, go enjoy it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah.
I, I think you have to figure out. I think you have to figure out what works best for you. Uh, if if you find that having an additional 10, 15, 20 minutes of meditation in your day has a big impact in your day and in your life, then I'd find the time for it. If you find that you can get that in the tefillah, then just do it in the davening. I, I, I think a question like that is like really personal. For some people, uh, they, they really get the full kind of energizing experience from davening itself. For other people, they get more of that energizing experience, more of the openness from sitting and just spending time, whether it's a mindfulness meditation or using an app or a breathing meditation, whatever it is you're gonna do. If you're gonna get something from that experience that you're not gonna get from the other thing, so I, I would find time for it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think the two things that I have found to be like really practical for me is if, if something is really, let's, let's use an example where there's something heavy, right? Something's like really weighing on you. Someone you know, chas is sick, or you know, let's talk about you know, the week of October 7th, right? You know, things are really heavy. Um, those are the times that I really, I spend extra time in silence, in quiet. Uh, it, act, it, like, it requires an active quieting of that. Not to push it away, but to kind of allow it to be there and, and really give space for that. And that's, that's a time thing. But then you go to more, I would say, you know, daily routine things where there's just a lot of stuff going on in your head. Uh, I find that the only way for me to really be fo to focus and be present is to spend time, either, like even before I came in here, I sat and I did a short tefillah before I walked in. I, before I speak anywhere, I ask a Kaddish Baruch Hu to help me be present, uh, to appreciate the people that I'm going to be with, and I'll do that throughout the day. You know, if I had a long day and I come home, before I walk in, I'll kiss the mezuzah and I'll say a short tefillah. So I find that tefillah is very powerful um, to, to reorient myself into what I'm about to walk into. Well, I tell them that also. <laughs> I think moment to moment prayer, if prayer is hard for them or if God doesn't exist in their lexicon, so I would call it setting intentions. So you set the intention to be present. Uh, but really being present is a, is a practice of noticing. It's like really practicing and learning how to be aware. Right? So a lot of people think that meditation is about meditation. Like I'm gonna meditate for 15 minutes or 20 minutes and then I'm gonna go on in my life. And what I have found is they meditate for 15 minutes, they feel really good, and then they're honking their horn in the car and they're yelling at the guy in the market and they can't believe that there's a line and the meditation doesn't translate into the rest of their life. The, the whole purpose of a, of a meditation is to practice seeing things happening inside of you and then releasing and allowing them to just go. So like a thought comes through and then a thought comes out and you, you recognize that they're ephemeral and that everything that's taking place in the inner world doesn't really hold a grip in your life. So if you're, if you're really using meditation for what it is, so then you bring that practice into your life and you get in the car and there's traffic and you take a deep breath and you see the thought come in of like, oh my God, I'm gonna be late, I'm so angry. And you're like, and that was just a thought. And then you stay. So uh, the real practice of presence is an ongoing practice of noticing awareness and then releasing. Yeah? Yeah. We've been speaking a lot about very, very, a very good topic. And however, what I fear most is that it, it, it's stuck here within like this intellectual paradise. We're all saying true, very nice things. We're all sharing, but it, what are some strategies that, that you've made over the past years to help up, up, apply this knowledge that you've gained and to make it real? So I think it's similar uh, to the question the rabbi just asked in that the beginning of this whole process, which by the way, is to, to answer your question with a, a preface, that's exactly, by the way, one of the reasons why I write books, because it's just not possible for me to share everything I wanna share in an hour or whatever it is, right? So unless we have like a 10 hour full immersion seminar, uh, it's gonna be hard to get through quite a lot. Uh, but the beginning of everything is awareness. Actually taking the time for some people, they can do it without writing things down. But if you're a person that likes to journal or keep notes in your phone or wherever it is, wherever you keep your notes, 
The beginning of everything is awareness. A, there are good pointers that you can start to keep in your life. One of them is, uh, why am I not at peace right now? Like, why am I not already happy at this moment? And like, ask yourself, why, why don't I feel great right now? That's, that's an important question. You sit with that. You're like, well, what do you mean? Why would I feel great? And then you have a list of reasons why you don't feel great right now. And you're like, oh, here are all the thoughts in my brain, not the realities, the thoughts in my brain that keep me from feeling good right now because I feel like he's mad at me, because I'm behind in my work, because of da 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 da. You have all these reasons, but then you stop and you have to realize those reasons, it's not that they're reasons, those are thoughts in your mind. And now you write them down. You're like, ah, here are these th thoughts. And if you start doing that, even if you just did it weekly, it works better if you do it daily. But if you start keeping track of all the reasons why you're upset, all the reasons why you're unhappy, all the reasons why you're not at peace, you start to notice the patterns inside. It's like, oh, I've got this pattern. It, every, t every day at this time, or every time this happens, or every time I see this person, I always have these thoughts. What, what could I think instead? Maybe this is based on a belief that isn't true. Maybe I have an expectation that doesn't go there. So it's we have to start looking at our life almost like a map. Something happens in the world, in our life, that produces a certain feeling. The feeling was predicated on a thought. The thought was predicated on a belief. And you can start to check them. Just, it's, it's so much about noticing. It's so much about awareness. So when you talk about like what's a practical way to integrate. So, you know, I'll, I'll give you a mushroom. I, I use this muscle all the time because it was true for me. I, I love, I don't know why, I'm, I'm built this way. I love being on time. <laughs> like, I really, really like being, some people are like, I like to be late. They don't even know they like to be late. They're just always late. I have, I have a daughter like that. <laughs> like, she's just always late, like no matter what you do. Like just part of this part of, uh, my nature is the opposite. I like to be there on time. It, it used to be, if there was traffic on the way to somewhere, I could lose my mind. I, I don't even know why. I'm just angry, frustrated. Why is this happening? We all have things in our life that are exactly like that, where something shows up and that's your pet peeve, right? I have another one, but maybe not for now. So when you start to realize, oh, every time I get in that situation, I'm having this response. I'm having a thought about something. So I then realize, oh, I have a certain paradigm and if my preconceived notion doesn't come true, I get upset. So I suffer because of my own preconceived notion. Well, that's the, the biggest level of free will is, well, I can change that. I don't have to look at life that way. And so now, when I get in the car and I'm going to be late, like I once had to be in Lakewood for Shabbaton, and to make a long story short, it wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> but there was so much traffic that they were like, you're not gonna make it. Uh, anybody here from the East Coast? Yeah, okay, so I was on the, I was leaving the five towns and there's a highway, belt, a belt. Belt Parkway. Yeah, there's a, like, it's a belt you have to take to go, right, I don't know. And uh, it should take like 15 minutes, I, get, I guess, to get to JFK from the five towns. Yeah. And we were in the car for two hours and I don't know New York all that well. And they were like, we're not gonna make it to Lakewood. And I said, why? They're like, because we've been in the car for two hours and we're not yet at JFK. And uh, we're still like four hours away from Lakewood. So they looked at me, they're like, do you have a place to stay for Shabbos? I said, yeah, in Lakewood. <laughs> and they're like, you're not gonna make it. Shabbos is in an hour. Uh, so I ended up spending Shabbos with them. And the old version of me would have been like, oh my gosh, all this work, all this effort, all the people who are gonna show up, all the, and I, I would have completely fallen apart. And the new version is, oh, I guess I have to call them and let them know I'm not coming. That's gonna be challenging. What should I do for Shabbos? I'm like, it is what it is. And it's really stepping into, Gamzu Latova doesn't have to be, I know how it's good. People think Gamzu Latova is, even this is good, and I can show you how. Gamzu Latova doesn't mean, and I can show you how. It just means this, this can be good. I have no idea how, but my openness to it is what allows me to move through the experience. That's maybe one or two practical applications, if that's helpful.
Okay, guys, if anyone wants to, uh, I want to thank Reb Moshe. Such a beautiful uh, talk, very inspirational. Um, we will be here, available to talk. I have three uh, different books up front, so if you'd like them, come and see me. And guys, you've been great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. It. Yeah. Uh,